Top Med Talk. All right, I am Desiree Chapel with Top Med Talk, and we are at the 2018 Intensive Care Society State of the Art meeting down in central London at the QE2 Center. Right, I got it right this time. Spot on. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and we have the privilege to sit down again with uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery. Uh, and we have a couple, an- another new guest we'll be bringing in in just a second. I'm going to create a little suspense here. And then uh, the editor in chief of Top Men Talk, Monty Mythen. So, hello, Monty. Hey, Desiree, Mythen, good to be here. here. Yes. Hugh, it good is. to have you back. It Thank is. you very much. Thank you. Hugh, we wanted to, uh, we've been chatting a little bit in between sessions um, about hydration. And right. we thought it would be a great topic to, hmm. uh, you know, kind of go over here on Top Men Talk. So, start us off. How, do, how did the, uh, this topic kind of come up? Well, it's interesting. So uh, on a personal basis, it came up because I watched both my parents die dehydrated. And uh, when you know, when you see dehydration writ big, it's obvious to everyone. But the problem is how you detect it when it's not writ big. Um, And this concerned us because we were hearing all these stories about, well, too much fluid in surgery is bad and too little fluid is bad. And how are you meant to know what the right amount of fluid is? In other words, what is dehydration? So actually, we pulled together a consensus conference last year or earlier this year, in fact, of experts from sports medicine, clinical physiology, cardiology, nephrology, intensive care medicine and more. Um, to s- try to work out what this thing called dehydration was, what its implications might be, how would you measure it, detect it, define it. And the interesting thing is um, we couldn't start, nor could we find a definition that was workable in the literature. So we know that dehydration means taking water away from something or leaving it with less water than it did have. And I guess pathological dehydration would be having too little water to be healthy. But there isn't a literature that tells you accurately how to define that and how to detect it and with what thresholds and sensitivities and specificities it's linked to particularly bad outcomes. And this is a real worry because we've spent a lot of time monitoring and doing all sorts of things. It turns out out. we haven't actually Mm -hmm. worked out where we should be in the first place. So um, we had with us your special guest yeah. who <laughs> another I extra introduce. special guest <laughs> so um, Finton who was working with us uh, doing research at the time and we asked Finton to go to the literature um, where, where, where's Finton from ah, Finton so gets- Finton's from Ireland um, but came to work with us at UCL and we asked him to review the literature to see if he could help determine the best clinical and physiological index of dehydration now first thing to say is we had to divide all those things up saying dehy- not all dehydration is the same it depends whether the water comes out the cell or out of the interstitium or out of the intervascular space and so forth but if we're talking about global lack of body water what was the answer to that Vinton? what was the best measure overall lack of body water um, after a certain period of time when everything has a, a chance to equilibrate was um, plasma osmolality on one hand and then a combination of whatever other measures of overall, I suppose, hypovolemia or not could be could be found, largely being clinical signs. But from one static measure, it was pretty clearly plasma osmolality. Now, is that, remind me, is that a standard, is the same osmolality cut off the same for all of us? So if my osmolality goes beyond X, does that make me dehydrated? Is X the same for you and Monty and Desiree? Not off necessarily a single number. There are two. There are two almost loose thresholds that are banded about um, upwards of 295 milliosmoles. So a normal range being, say, nominally, uh, depending on the lab, 275 to 295. So thought that above 295 was indicative of indicative of pre dehydration, and above 300 milliosmoles per kilo being. Um, clinically relevant levels of dehydration. Right. Now, for me, this is where I struggle. So I'm looking at Monty here as well, because <laughs> if you're going to determine whether what a test means for defining abnormality, it's going to be measured against some gold standard, right? Yeah. So what's the gold standard when we say, aha, that's dehydration? What's the gold standard to say that that thing called dehydration is? Um, so there essentially was no definitive gold standard used. There's, there's very little to be found to... To point at, to point to, and say, a plasma osmolality greater than three hundred is indicative of this degree of fluid loss. Um, in that, those studies essentially have have yet to be done, um, and the fluid that you're going to take off, it would, um, 
needs to be quite strictly defined as well to decide what what sort of dehydration you're going to induce because then you, you right. branch into pure water loss or salt water loss. Right. So first thing, it's a problem. If you lose salt and water, the osmolalities can go down, but you can still be dry. We haven't got a cutoff that says this number means badness. The other thing, Monty, I guess, you know, surely we're just damn good at doing this clinically, right? Uh, well, um, cut a long story short, it would appear that we're really not very good at doing this clinically. Okay. I think patients, particularly uh, younger, fitter, healthier, not on any drugs patients, are very good at trying to maintain hydration by having access to drink and drinking. And when they're examined, that's where the information comes from that suggests that this os- measured osmolality equals normal hydration because they're kind of self-fulfilling prophecies you measure it mm-hmm. normal people gets more complicated to get older gets more complicated with surgery gets more complicated with illness gets more complicated with drugs uh, but clinically it would appear that often we leave people dehydrated now we have to be clear mm. that that is a relative lack of water right so you can be salt and water overloaded right. and dehydrated i'm going to bat that one back to you because right. that's the, that's the post surgical patient who tells you they're thirsty who's three litres positive and no one will give them water they're blown up like a balloon right and they're blown oh, up like a balloon. well of course so this is again we've just digging into semantic scenario. I would say someone who's full of huge amounts of salt and water isn't dehydrated they are water overloaded but, but they have relatively an, they, dehydrated they have indeed they have an imbalance of the two okay um, so what do they need well we could go round the circus. Of course, evidence base is very poor. Um, but we do know, of course, that kidneys find it very hard to get rid of salt and water when osmolalities are high and they think they're in a desert because yeah. that's partly what they're yeah. measuring is going, I'm in a desert, I'm going to hang on to salt and water. Which is why your boss and mine back in the day, Andy Webb, used to say, once you go beyond sodium is 150, you give people X amount of water, essentially, an hour, until it's less than that, because before then the patient can't stop so weeing. Let, let's just paint that picture for a moment, and Desiree will put you back in, in the chair, because uh, you'll be very familiar with this, because <laughs> you do a lot of perioperative work, is it's that patient who postoperatively is three, four, five litres of saline, let's call mm. it saline positive, so right. high salt-rich solution, who tells you they're thirsty, and they're relatively oliguric, because the body's trying to hang on to water and therefore the next thing you're going to do is give them a fluid bolus which guess what is more salt (laughs) and water have you ever seen that (laughs) every every day okay open the roller clamp so i'm going to bat this back to monty because monty you're irish and um (laughs) no finton i don't know i was just going to say and so is finton in fact on that i call i'm going to use the backstop if you're not careful we're opposite opposite Mm. parliament (laughs) here and the backstop is still in potentially in play at the moment so just leave the irish out of this well i think the irish have got oh, that what's great. this got to do with well this? it's <laughs> the it's the old thing about you know how do i get to wherever it might be well i wouldn't start from here and i wouldn't start from there by giving my patient five <laughs> okay. liters of but, saline but it happens the whole time <laughs> no, but it shouldn't happen you know yeah, that's all right. just move on from that for a second that's but all it, you're going to go in next week and you're going to see them it's a first line i mean it's the first line not in our hospitals well mm. done you yeah but all yours. Not, let's, we'll come back to that in a second but in loads of places that's the case so that's true I, with that patient, if I'd made that diagnosis, they clearly are, their weight is up, mm-hmm. yeah. the chart suggests that they've had too much salt and water, they otherwise seem to be well, everything yeah. should work, they're telling you they're thirsty, Yes. I may give them some free water, so I may give them yes. some D5 to drop the osmols and let them pee naturally, yes. or I may give them some a little bit of diuretic and some free water, that would be my approach to it. And I don't think those are remotely unreasonable. I think you're right. But the first, of course, rule of medicine is first do no harm. Right. So let's not get them in that pickle in the first place. We, but we, once they're in the pickle... <laughs> promise, we promise to come back to that. I think, I think right. we're agreed about the way to approach it. Okay. I mean, the big question for me, though, is um, if you... Well, Monty, you were involved in this study. We looked at a very large number of patients in the hundreds of thousands of admissions. And we used urea creatinine ratio as an index of dehydration. And it's not perfect because there are things like GI bleeds and heart failure things that can artificially raise your urea creatinine. But it's not a bad index. And we excluded GI bleeds and heart failures and the things that might be artifactual. 82% of those admissions were dehydrated by that measure at some point during their hospital admission. And nearly half the patients who weren't dehydrated when they arrived got dehydrated in hospital. And we do know that dehydration is associated with bad outcomes 
anywhere you look. So stroke, orthopedic surgery, cardiac patients, general medical patients, it matters not. It's associated with badness to the order of tens of folds of increase in mortality. So for me, the question is, why are we getting this so wrong? And if there is a causal relationship, how do we manage it better? Because I don't know about the States, but for us, a uh, surgical world round might be typically um, and a consultant, attending physician, I guess, doing a ward round at 8 o'clock in the morning, very quickly, checking wounds, whatever, clearing off to operate. Finton, as the junior doctor on the ward, left to try and manage things. He writes up a litre of something or other. He goes off shift eight hours later. Someone else comes and writes something else up. The bloods aren't done until the next day, which may have changed. So there's a lag in looking at response and correcting response. response and, yeah. and so how do we mm. overcome that? I know that you and I have been trying to work this one out, Monty. So, so the difficulty that I've found in practice is that so over, over the last few months working in ICU is you go to the patient, they are clearly edematous, they have a high sodium, and you think, fine, I'll give... I'll give them free water or yeah. be that NG water or um, 5% DEX and then you have this thing in the back of your head that says well can I, I can't drop their sodium this quickly to what degree do I need to be concerned about that um, that combined with um, what diuretics you need to be giving so fruzmide we saw in our initial work looked like it was causing some naturesis but you, you get I mean, presumably a, a loss of free water there Whereas, say, you're using a, like a predominantly thiazide-like diuretic, you're going to lose more sodium. Is the aim, is the aim sodium correction? Or? Well, I'm, my personal feeling is I don't think we know, but my response is the, the Monty described, that if you're hypernatremic mm-hmm. um, and water overloaded, it's very, very hard to get rid of that salt yeah. when your kidneys are detecting hyperosmolality. So I end up having to drop it with water so they can pee. But we all know sometimes it's very hard to get rid of those, and those are the patients who every now and again you just stick have, have to stick on a hemofilter because it's the only way really well, to... Uh, uh, we'll be, we're talking from an intensive care doctor's yeah. perspective yeah. there for a second. Most people are out on the floor yeah. where it's harder. Yeah. So, so that, I, I think that's from... But so I think that's true. I think it's very hard, though, isn't it? Enabling drinking if they can drink. Yeah. Because that's one of the technologies we've been working on, is it's mm. really hard to drink in hospital. Yes. Yeah. Because the common challenge is the full water jug or pitcher mm-hmm. and the glass, which is terrible technology to enable drinking. Now, there's a bit more... We're all sitting here with these bottles that have things on the top that allow us to suck out of them. This is making life a little bit easier for the person in bed. But Hugh, your personal experiences was, I think you ended up with getting your parents' camel backs, didn't you? Or yeah. There are other oh, devices wow. available. Yes. Yeah. This is a BBC rules here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but something that made it easy to drink while lying flat. Yeah, so my father's situation, he had myeloma, so he got wedge compression fractures of his spine, uh, which meant that he was in pain and lying flat and couldn't sit up. He was sentient, he knew he was thirsty, but he couldn't reach the jug. In his late 70s, if he could reach the jug, lifting a kilo and a half of weight with an outstretched hand would have been hard. Pouring a glass while lying horizontally, trying to look down your own chest to do it, is very, very difficult. And drinking without aspirating if you're lying flat is difficult, even if you've got normal bulbar function, as any of us who've tried to drink lying flat would know. Um, So I did indeed get in the camel back, and that did indeed make an awful lot of difference. So, and... um one of the things that we've been, we should declare a conflict of interest yeah. here. We have intellectual property that uh, you, you, is not commercialized at the moment, but that's yeah. the route we're pursuing along with others, is using hanging reservoirs of fluid, because that's ubiquitous in hospitals, yes. and, and some device that um, is easily held in the hand that allows you to drink from a straw, basically, that comes from a hanging reservoir. Yes. So that, that's one thing, is enabling drinking is one thing. So, Fintan, you're, you, you're out on the floor quite a lot now, I'm imagining. Uh, yep. Drinking with patients, harder than you'd expected? Or? Uh, yes, and I've been surprised how few patients are looking to drink. Right. Um, Even though they say that they're thirsty? They will say they're thirsty once prompted. Okay. I have rarely come to patients who said, oh, I'm having difficulty drinking. They'll, I'll, in my general assessment, will be saying, well, are you thirsty? Oh, actually, yes, I suppose I am. And it seems like some sort of additional stimulus is needed to trigger it in. Well, it, think about this. So Monty and I have been doing some experiments d- deliberately dehydrating people. That's, yeah. We're using exercise in a very humid environment uh, in the heat. Um, and that really does dry you out. It makes you very thirsty. 
And one of the things we're beginning to notice is that the Osma receptors detecting dryness um, are working like any other receptor. They've got a fast transient and then they've got a slow stimulus. So if you walk into the freezing cold sea, the first thing you get is a screaming, ow, wow, wow, this is really, really, really cold. And if you stand there for a while longer, it remains feeling cold, but it's nowhere near the big hit you got with the change. And my strong feeling, Fintan, and I have no proof for this, is that what you're describing is that in the process of becoming dehydrated quickly, people would have gone, I'm so thirsty, Fintan, please give me a drink. It's a new stimulus. Right. But if you leave them for a day, they sort of, the, it dies down to a background where people, it's a, it's a hassle to get themselves rehydrated. Yeah. So I do think probably it's important that we stop the dehydration in the first place. Uh, we get in early and we try to say to people that this is important, not that you fluid overload yourself, but that you do maintain adequate fluid intake because otherwise bad things can come of this. And certainly, I know Monty and I have talked about this before, but whilst we say we're really rubbish at clinical assessment, you know, skin turgor, eyeballs, mucous membranes, all those other things, the key thing I always ask a patient is, are you thirsty? Mm. And if they're sentient and they say, I am so thirsty, doctor, I say, then if you can't drink... I'm going to drop a litre of 5% glucose into you and I'm going to see how you are. And I keep doing that until they go, do you know what? Thank you, doctor. I'm not thirsty anymore. Do, do you add to that, Hugh, um, are you just, do you have a dry mouth and you just want a mouth wet or are you gagging yeah. for a drink? If you no, should, most people tell you the difference, actually, if yes, they're, yeah, they're yeah, sensitive. Yeah, no, most people yeah. say, uh, well, I've got a bit of a dry mouth. Yeah. Can I just have a mouth wet? Yeah. yeah. Um, but they know if they're thirsty and I'm sure, you know, I think we've all assess patients the same way haven't we for that yeah one thing I found astonishing is I worked on an ENT service for two weeks where mm. in my centre there's a lot of uh, big head and neck surgery so there would have been a lot of people who were had sort of newly formed newly formed tracheoesophageal fistulas mm. and were NPO long term NPO and were sitting there as their standard of care would be a small sponge in a glass of water to quench their thirst yeah. whereas realistically <laughs> they're sitting there having checked a few Osmolalities, they were sitting around 310 plus. Ooh. Wow. Holy Not to cow. indict anybody, but <laughs> that's. Um, yeah. there, seems to be, there seem to be definitely certain populations within the hospital where it's sort of accepted that yes, they're thirsty, well, they're NPO, you know, that's, that's how they will be. I think that probably happens a whole lot more, especially, uh, you know, people that have not adopted the early feeding drinking thing after surgery too that they're kind of sitting there i can't tell you how many patients come in like can i just have something you know and they'll just be sucking on a yeah a a little sponge you know and dipping it in the water and you're i don't know if in that that context uh the context of enhanced recovery elective surgery whether it's practiced or not at least the direction of travel has been to abandon Mm -hmm. npo to to permit people to drink but actually to encourage people to drink i say drink that beforehand yeah to try and get them to the operating room hydrated and yeah. carb loaded and uvolemic and all that stuff. But going to your, back to the post-operative patient, and let's put them back in intensive care okay. where it's highly monitored. It's that patient who you, do, you work the numbers and you say, look, they're, they're three litres positive. So they're now into the zone of danger. One to two litres positive may be the zone of safety, maybe the zone of benefit. They're now in the zone of danger. They can tell you how they feel and they say they're thirsty you look at their sodium and it's elevated you you don't have to calculate osmolality at that stage you need to be brave enough to if they can't drink freely to stop the salt rich fluids and give them some Mm -hmm. salt poor fluids and that's where the d5 test and we're in a very secure environment to do that so without hesitation we we might give 500 mils we might give a a, a liter that's not going to bomb the sodium and give them problems it's going to rehydrate them yeah Yeah. I, i just don't we don't see this anymore because we don't give salt-rich solutions. I mean, that's, that's the truth of the matter now, because most patients are water deplete when they can't drink water. Yeah. I'm not sodium deplete, yes. and I eat very little sodium. I'm very good at hanging on to sodium, thank you, and so yes. is nearly everybody else. Yes. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is I really object to my juniors just telling me about balances, because we don't know where the insensible losses were and how much when the belly was open during the operation how much is sequestered in the ileus there could be a litre or two sitting in your gut for all I know Uh, so I do make sure that I can't find signs of tissue edema so I do look for so let's give this patient tissue edema Okay, well, then, yeah. then they are salt and water overload, and then we go back to where we were earlier on. I mean, they're probably going to need extra water to help get rid of the salt. To answer make them... question, how, how much would you give him intravenously without being nervous about causing harm? Can we make me diabetic as well? 
so that we're concerned about. Does that give any concern no, about that, D5? That doesn't uh, give me any concerns at all because the number of calories in a litre of D5 isn't huge and yeah. I can manage it giving you insulin, so I'm not remotely worried about that at all. Um, I would be looking at other measures to make sure I'm not intravascularly massively fluid overloading you by giving you yeah. an extra mm. X because if I raise your left atrial pressure, I don't want to exactly give you pulmonary edema when your albumin, for instance, might be low. So I think you have to take all these things in context. If there's tissue edema, etc etc it could be post-operatively that your albumin's 22 in which case filling you to a cvp of 25 is going to be a, clearly a very bad thing now on the floor on the ward most times you're going to be reverting to getting patients to drink in icu we're going to have certain patients where that is not an option mm-hmm. now let's imagine out on the floor on the ward you have certain patients who can't drink tell us you about some of the research we've been involved with where we're allowing patients to hydrate themselves right so intravenously hydrate themselves. intravenously hydrate that's themselves. the wacky bit this is the good bit so there's no reason at all if you recognize thirst and you would normally take water why you can't take the water intravenously PC so we've taken normal subjects and finton did this work dehydrating people and this was open and unblinded and we found that patients could very well rehydrate themselves with allowing themselves to give themselves the intravenous fluid and they could do it better than the standard guidance that we have in britain for that so basically this is we've we've jerry-rigged with all the permissions yeah. uh, patient controlled analgesia PCA. Right that's what I say, pcw <laughs> patient yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it all, is this is all ethically approved all done correctly yeah. yeah with support blah 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 but basically it's patient controlled intravenous hydration hit the button get a bolus of what did you give them finton d5 half dextrose saline four percent dex and fifth normal saline yeah okay and, and, and they, they, they nailed it, yeah? Yeah, they nailed yeah. it. And we've Everything. now since done a study. Published? Uh, mm-hmm. That's now... PJ. Yeah, published in the British Journal of Anesthesia. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Fenton. Hooray, Fenton, well know, done. Congrats. Those of you who are listening who are looking for good young doctors, his name is Fenton Hughes, you'll find him on the internet. Um, Hugh, what have you done recently, though? The well, most recently, so these are, this is the first discussion of these data. They're not published yet, uh, so I won't reveal all of the data. That would be unfair on our co-authors. But we've done this dehydration study, again, of healthy volunteers... And now we've done it as a properly blinded study. So the subjects are hitting the button um, and they're getting 50 mil boluses or they're getting 250 mil boluses. And I was one of those subjects. And I tell you that the way it was done, I really genuinely couldn't tell whether I was getting 50 or 250. And you can hit the button as often as you like every 10 minutes to see where you get. And it turns out people very, 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 very accurately rehydrate themselves to within 200 mils of the fluid loss, completely blind, (laughs) to uh, (laughs) knowing how much they're getting. And when they get back up there, they stop hitting the button. If they're getting the lower volume, they keep hitting it right the way through because they just don't give up. They are still thirsty. And that just fits with what Vincent's telling us. The the body senses dehydration using osmolality. That's, we've got... Yeah, so you have osmoreceptors in your brainstem. Yeah. The drier you are, the less fluid comes out of those and the less frequently those those junctions will fire. As you rehydrate yourselves... That cell swells, and then it fires more frequently. And then that is an inverse fires to your hypothalamus to tell you you're thirsty or not thirsty. The cool thing, the fact that that runs so quickly, is about two hours into my trial, you could see that people who had, given, who had gotten their useful, you know, they'd gotten, say, a litre or so, their, both their thirst scores had come down considerably, and with that, their rate of fluid administration had dropped as well. So it's responding in a time-dependent <laughs> manner. <laughs> so, I mean, we can't yet say whether if you're doped up with morphine or... That's what I was just going to ask. It's, if it's you have somebody, in, but, or you know, the, somebody that's sick, you know, that's sick... The patients about eating. which we've been speaking, so these could be bulbar, stri- bulbar palsy patients or people that post operatively aren't allowed to eat or drink, but they're uh-huh. perfectly sentient. There's yeah. lots of reasons why they can't. Why would you not do what I do anyway, which is walk up and say, are you thirsty? Mm-hmm. Make sure that I can give them some more. And this is a little bit like patient-controlled analgesia. People saying, oh, that morphine, that's very dangerous stuff. Only doctors should give that. And patients were in screaming pain or massively overdosed. And now we just put safe limits. We yeah. get people to take a certain amount with boluses, X Lock number of yeah. Do it the same with fluids. Put the limits in there. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the nice thing is bags at the moment come in one litre bag. So even if someone hits the button four times, you're going to have to come and change the bag. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there are lots of safety limits involved here. And I certainly now at a stage, and I don't have equipoise, is that I personally, were I sentient and had capacity, like to manage my own mm-hmm. intravenous hydration. hydration. We, we should, for all those people listening who think we're just crazy, <laughs> maybe we know that giving a whole load of no. salt-free water drops your sodium, causes fits, can harm people. Got all of that, but there is a situation you have a baseline need for free water mixed in with there. We're talking... We're talking a, a small number of litres here given safely and appropriately to treat 
a dehydrated state. And we have to remember that I don't drink salt-rich fluids during the day, and I don't have to keep going to buy myself bags of chips yeah. covered in salt to top that up as I drink my cups of tea or drink my beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And remember, we touched on this in an earlier podcast. You mentioned earlier about the 5% dextrose. We know mm-hmm. why the 5% dextrose is there to make it isoworld's molar, originally judged by not lysing red cells. We also keep reminding ourselves of the co-transporter at a cellular level, which is sugar dependent. Mm. So to get the water into the cells, you do need some sugar around, Mm. which is why sort of WHO rehydration oral fluids always contain some sugar. Different things go on in the gut compared to if you give it directly into Mm. a vein. Yeah. But it's still a smart thing to do. Yes. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much. This is absolutely fantastic. Any other last comments? No. What a beautiful day. Why are we in here? I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I know. I only have one more day left here. i got to get outside. Um, well, thanks so much. We'll uh, carry on the conversation later on today. Brilliant. Thank thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. Thanks. Thanks, you. thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favorite social media feed is, we're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com, and get on board with the email updates. Oh, whilst you're at it as well, I suggest you download our entire back catalogue. We're categorising at the moment. We're having a little look through it. It may not always be in the form that you currently find it. So if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website, perhaps, or perhaps through your podcatcher. Oh, and if you fancy meeting us, why not go to the website, ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event is EBPOM USA, the Dallas Masters course, a perioperative care practicum. Have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.